Okay, good afternoon Year 10 and good afternoon Year 11 resetters who failed your exams last time. What I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is go through Module B1, which is you and your genes. Basically, what you have to know is where your genes are found, how they're located, what they do, etc, etc. So starting from scratch, bear in mind inside your body you have trillions of cells. Now, inside every single cell, there is a nucleus. And inside that nucleus is where we find the genetic material. It's found in the form of chromosomes. And there are 23 pairs of chromosomes inside every single nucleus. Now, I say pairs because you get one of your chromosomes, or one side of your chromosomes, from your dad, remember, found in the sperm. So inside a sperm, you have 23 single chromosomes. You get the other 23 from your mum, which are found inside the egg. So inside an egg, you have 23 single chromosomes. When they come together, they form a fertilized egg cell. A fertilized egg cell has 46 chromosomes, or 23 pairs of chromosomes inside it. And it is called a zygote. That's Z-Y-G-O-T-E. Now, the chromosomes themselves are long strands, and upon them we have smaller sections called genes. Now, a gene in itself codes for a particular feature, such as eye colour, or skin colour, or hair colour, etc, etc. The genes themselves are made up of a chemical called DNA. Now, because you have two copies of each chromosome, one from your mum and one from your dad, it also stands to reason that you have two copies of the same gene, one from your mum, one from your dad. These copies or versions of the same gene are called alleles. Very important word. A double L E L E S. Now, some alleles can be dominant and some are recessive. If it's a dominant allele, we represent with a capital letter. If it's a recessive allele, we represent with a smaller letter. And remember that for a recessive allele to show, there has to be two of them together. Okay? Now, the chromosomes themselves, the 23rd pair, are very, very important because these are called the sex chromosomes. If you're a little boy, you have an X chromosome and another... No, you don't. You have a Y chromosome, don't you? So it has an X and a Y. And if you're a girl, you have an X and an X. On the Y chromosome itself, there is a gene to produce a hormone called testosterone. And that's what makes a male a male. Remember, testosterone is released at twice during your life, really. Once in the fetus to form the primary sexual sex organs such as the penis and then secondarily a secondary effect is found at the age of about 12 to 13 when you hit puberty and these are called your secondary sexual characteristics and they will be things such as a deep voice muscles hair growth and sperm production okay moving on from there you need to understand that most of the characteristics actually are not caused by a single gene, but are caused by multiple genes working together. So, for instance, your height is affected by a number of different genes, as is your weight. In addition to that, you have environmental factors. Now, an environmental factor is something which affects you from your surrounding environment, such as my accent, you might notice, is different from yours. Well, that's because I was born somewhere else. It's not in my genes to speak in a funny accent, it's just because I was born in Wales. You speak in a stupid accent and you can't pronounce your T's because you were born in Essex. Okay, so that would be an environmental factor. Something such as eye colour, of course, would be simply genetic. Now, every now and again you get a mutation and we get what we call a genetic disorder. There are two genetic disorders which you need to know about in particular. One of them is called Huntington's disease and the other one is called cystic fibrosis. Starting with Huntington's disease, bear in mind, very importantly, that Huntington's is caused by a dominant allele. Cystic fibrosis, on the other hand, is caused by a recessive allele. Huntington's is a terrible disease. If one of your parents has Huntington's disease, there is a 50% chance that it will be passed to you. If both your parents have Huntington's disease, there is a 100% chance that it is passed to you. The symptoms of Huntington's disease are, to start off with, shaking, tremors, slurring of speech, and almost symptoms which, which, which implicate drunkenness. As it goes on, what it does is starts destroying the brain and nerve connections in your body, causing spasms, loss of the ability to speak, eat or walk, and inevitably, eventually, it leads to death. 
there is no cure for Huntington's disease. The second disease is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is characterized by a buildup of thick, sticky mucus on the inside of your bronchial tubes, in your lungs, and also in your digestive system. What this thick, sticky mucus does in your lungs is prevents you from breathing properly. So people with cystic fibrosis tend to have physiotherapy so that they can breathe, or they use a nebulizer so that they can breathe. Um, also what it does is all the thick, sticky mucus makes wonderful food for bacteria. So you get large bacterial buildups around the body, which means cystic fibrosis sufferers have to take large courses of antibiotics to deal with this. They tend also to be malnourished because, of course, the mucus can also be found in the digestive system, notably near the pancreas. When this happens, it stops the absorption of nutrients from your food into your body, so they can be malnourished and need vitamin supplements. One of the ways that it can be treated is something called gene therapy. Now it's important you understand this concept. What gene therapy is, is the replacement of unhealthy DNA in some of the cells of the body by healthy DNA. What they tend to do is this. They take a section of healthy DNA and they insert it into a carrier, usually a virus. Then the virus is introduced to the body, either through an injection or through an inhaler. When a virus goes into the body, what it does, it replaces the unhealthy DNA with the healthy DNA. So for a short time at least, the person gets relief from the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. The features about gene therapy is though, that it never ever cures the disease. It just pr provides relief for a short amount of time. Okay, the other thing you could do of course, if you suspect that your child is going to have a genetic disease, is genetically test for them. There's ways they can do this. One is called pre-implantation -implant diagnosis or PGD. What you have to be able to do is give both the pros and the cons of genetic testing. Remember, not all genetic tests are accurate, which means you could, you could get a false negative or a false positive result. And also, is it ethical to abort a fetus simply because they're carrying a genetic disease? You need to give both sides of this argument in your examinations. Moving on from there, we looked at clones. Now remember, a clone is an organism which is genetically identical to its parent, and it only has one parent, not two. This is called asexual reproduction, and it's perfectly natural and is found in plants, in strawberry plants, in spider plants. If you remember, we tried to clone a cauliflower, which went on monkey in brown, but we did try. So cloning is a natural process in certain, in certain plants and animals. Sexual reproduction, of course, has two parents, not one, and there is genetic variation between them. Now, when the embryo starts to grow, the cells that it produces are special cells called stem cells. It is very important you remember that. Stem cells are special cells which can form into any other type of cell. At the moment, the current research called embryonic stem cell research. Now, there's, again, there's ethical issues here because a lot of people believe that embryonic stem cell research shouldn't be allowed because what they do is they take stem cells from aborted fetuses and then they inject those into patients to try to promote cell growth. A lot of people think, again, this is unnatural. Religious people think um, it's unethical or amoral, etc., etc. So there are pros and cons, and again, you have to suggest what are the positives and what are the negatives to this type of research? Okay, I think that is about it. Anything else that you need to find out, I would suggest you go on the frontal learning path in front of you and try that out. Okay, good luck in your exams.